the Open Source Creative Podcast, episode 50. Holy crap, we made it to 50. <laughs> Design and user interface with Mo Duffy. This is the Open Source Creative Podcast, a podcast where I ramble on about creativity, process, and open source software. I'm Jason Van Gumster, your host and driver on the road to creative freedom. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on trying to make that sound good. Eh, we're, we're, we're getting it to be all right. In any case, this week, we get to talk to Maureen Duffy. Mo is a senior principal interaction designer at Red Hat, and she does all of her design work using free and open source software. We talk about her work, we talk about uh, challenges of designing user experiences in general, and we talk about, of course, how she does it all using a suite of open source tools. We also go a little bit into her thoughts on the quantitative database approach for UI design, which I think is a pretty interesting conversation because it's... Um, it's interesting to me, just not just the, the, the science part of that, but also just the, the notion that as designers and, and creatives, we are actually kind of trained for this sort of thing. So it's worth sort of broaching that conversation and, and, and talking about that. And um, really we want to contrast that with the, the experimental approach and just, you know, watching people work. In any case, um, there is a bit of background noise that I wasn't able to fully reduce in my sound processing, but hopefully you don't find it too distracting to listen to. So I'll just sort of keep that in mind. Uh, on a show related matter, I'm going to go back to commenting and discuss like I talked about in the last episode, uh, a lot of thought and, uh, and time going into it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with ISO or ISO. I don't actually know the proper way to pronounce it. I S S O, but, um, I'm going to have working on getting that set up. I have to self host it and get it running. Hopefully I'll have that set up before the next show comes around and then you, everyone can start putting comments on the actual episodes themselves. In addition to all the other ways of contacting me. Um, Another thing related to that, uh, again, I don't have any real interest in sponsors or, or subscription type things, but I do pay for my own hosting, like for the ISO commenting that I'll be getting on there, or ISO commenting, I guess I get the pronunciation right. So uh, if you like the show and, and you want to help me cover some of these costs, and I do write books, and I have a little bit of merchandise and stuff for sale on the uh, website, just go to the resources pay, uh, link menu, 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 uh, on opensourcecreative.org and see if anything there appeals to you. All right, now let's get on with the interview. Oh, we're going to toast marshmallows, are we? Could be. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode, and with us we have Maureen Duffy, or call her Mo, because it's easier for me to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> hey Mo, could you... But you me? nailed it. I did. You nailed it. <laughs> uh, I, I get one. I get one. <laughs> but if you could, go ahead and introduce yourself to, to everybody. Sure. So I am a UX designer at Red Hat. Uh, I very stubbornly use only open source creative tools um, throughout my tenure at Red Hat. It's kind of gotten me into trouble sometimes, but that's all right. And not not because of anything, just because I'm, I'm really stubborn. Um, and I've worked on a lot of different projects um, from uh, the Red Hat Network satellite project through a bunch of like distrust specific stuff to Fedora. Um, most recently, I've been working on the Chris project, which is an open source platform primarily aimed at medical institutions. Um, and we do image analysis, um, kind of taking the best medical plugins that exist out in the open source world that manipulate graphics like um, MRI images and x-rays and sort of making them more consistent to use on like a standardized platform to so like researchers basically don't have to be Linux hackers to be able to you know research medical images which is what their specialty is yeah, that's so that's what I've been working on recently um, yeah that's actually pretty interesting because just from my brief encounters with with medical imaging formats they're not always the most open or accessible formats either right there there yeah is that then do you is it are you just trying to deal with the exclusively ones that, that that are available and open or are you able to sort of like argue to people that that you know open formats are a good idea 
Yeah, so the ones that we primarily work with are like DICOM and Nifty, and I'm more familiar with DICOM. And I mean, I don't, I'm more on the platform side than actually the image manipulation side. So I'm more thinking about how do we display this in the metadata and the workflow of actually processing the images. But um, I, my understanding is that DICOM format is really like PNGs or JPEGs with some header information. So it sounds like it's scary, but it's really not. I think where you get into weird proprietary annoying stuff is um, different hardware made by different companies being more or less compatible in different ways. But I think the base image format is okay. I don't know if there's like an open standard for it. I, I hope there is, but um, you, you can crack them open and play with them, even with open source tools. So. Oh, cool. And that's, you're just basically using things like GIMP and, and I guess you wouldn't be using Inkscape because the raster formats, right? Yeah. So it's actually, there's a lot of specialized um, medical tools. Like one I can think of at the top of my head is called FreeSurfer. Mm -hmm. And FreeSurfer is used to do stuff like, um, It'll map out parts of the brain. Um, it'll it'll build sort of these three D visualizations based on because I don't I don't know how much you know about like MRIs and stuff, but it's very it's almost like three D. So right. you um you take slices across different axes. So what FreeSurfer does is it sort of looks at all the slices that you have from a scan and it can construct sort of a three D model of the brain and you can kind of cross section it to look at different things. It's it's really neat stuff. But cool. so that's like we're we're definitely like outside of the GIMP territory and more into very <laughs> very specialized tools um and they're all like the, the thing is is the state of the art for these things tends to be open source um but it's all different you know how research groups work so it'll be like this university that university got to write a paper okay i'll write the paper and that's when i work on the code to make it work so i can say it works for the paper and whatever um and it tends to be sort of a disorganized mess because these are people who are you know their their specialties medical imaging not packaging things or you know doing right. things the unix way so um that's sort of where we come in and to try to make the try to give them a platform and a format so that's taken care of for them and they can just focus on the bits of the code that actually do the image manipulation right on cool yeah i remember there was oh man this was a handful of years ago uh, i think it was campbell barton from the the blender development group uh, when they were still trying to develop the volumetrics uh, in in Blender, uh, he actually used, I think it was him, God, I, I hope I'm not getting it wrong, used uh, MRI data to build a, a volumetric profile. And so you could actually do, I don't think he really, it's actually, it's hard to use that for test material because HIPAA things are... <laughs> Um, yeah, well, yeah. And I mean, that's been sort of the bane for me is like a, a user experience researcher is like, it's not very easy to go out and talk to clinicians or, you know, even re medical researchers just because of that. Um, when we work with data, um, it's it's anonymized. So I mean, I don't have any details. Um, and we partner with Boston Children's Hospital. Okay. Um, they sort of actually drive the project and like me as a Red Hatter, I'm really just helping. Um, but they have a lot of access to sort of completely anonymized reference files. So we at least have that bit going for us. Now, I'm going to shift back a little bit because you said something that was funny, not funny, well, fu interesting to me because it's worth going to. So, so it's stubbornly using open source tools to <laughs> do design. Um, yeah. where, and it may or may not have gotten you into some level of trouble. Um, I mean that's a, that's that, that's that's a question waiting to be asked. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean it, it's more like in the general. I mean there, there's a lot of specific scenarios I could talk you through. I mean, once um, there was a changing of the guard in terms of my management chain at Red Hat, and for a very brief period of time, I was under a manager who gave me special permission to work with Inkscape instead of the Adobe Suite. So yeah, I was given special permission. Um, uh, and I mean, you know, God bless him. He was he was a very good designer. He was a very good manager, but he came from the more traditional proprietary background. And I, I think he just didn't know how to deal with this weirdo on his team that was being very loud and stubborn. Um, and, you know, I've I'm definitely like further along in my career now. And let's just say when I was younger, maybe I was a little less... Um, uh empathetic towards people who who chose to not use the open source tools so that that would get me in trouble every now and then but i i really think the best advocacy for the tools is just do an excellent job and you know using those tools right. like just do your job 
get it done and just show that like, you know, you can build amazing things. Oh, by the way, this is what I used. You know, that's how I get people. (laughs) It's just, just keep on carrying on and don't make it a thing. But then when it's important, bring it up and be like, yeah, I used Inkscape to do that. Yep. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's, it's, it's always been one of those trying to break out of that. And it's one of the weird things. Cause I mean, the whole, I mean, you were, you're at Red Hat, the whole sort of eating your own dog food thing and working with open source tools feels like it should be a thing. Um, yeah. So, and, 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 and to be fair, it is. I mean, there's, there's a whole large group of us that, you know, um, we've kind of actually hired a lot of people got to catch them all. Right. But, um, <laughs> there, there is a whole group of us at Red Hat that do do that. But, you know, there's also people that, you know, we hire them because they came from the design community and because of their skill there, not necessarily because they they started with the open tools. So right, well, and that's that is what it is. That's always the argument that that we end up making, right? It's not a, it's not the tool. The tool is the way you you do the thing. It's really that experience and 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 background. I don't know how many different closed source, open source people I've talked to on the design side of things. Where do you start? A oh, piece of paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's. Uh, a piece of paper, post-it notes, exactly. talking to people, taking notes. Yeah, oh, no talking. We, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but there, there is even, I mean, that's the other thing. And I've run into this with, with just trying to interact with people, usually contractors who are from the traditional design kind of proprietary background. They're like afraid to do things in the open. And I don't know if it's just because... I kind of grew up like as a kid growing up in the open source community, but, you know, just having an open process where anybody is allowed to contribute and where you show your work early. Like I've definitely noticed a tendency of more traditional designers to kind of want to, you know, keep things close and not show things until they're very close to being production ready. I don't know if it's just my experience, but no, it, it seems like there's a reluctance to like let the cat out of the bag before it's completely, I don't know, formed. And I, I've run into that as well, but and, and I, I've sort of formulated two two theories on that, and they're 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 mutually exclusive. So I don't really know which one which one works, but it all deals with sort. I mean, the the majority of designers, at least the ones that I've interacted with, have a um, I'll say an academic background. At least they, they, they went to art school. They went to design school. They went through that process. And usually, most of the time, especially if you end up going to, to a, a prestigious art school, the, the critique process is pretty brutal. Um, and so you either run into people who have sort of hardened themselves by that and oh, work out in the open. Sweet, we're going to work out in the open. Or you run into people who have been affected <laughs> by that <laughs> and like, All right, well, i'm going to show this when it's perfect and when it's done and really follow the sort of the fine art not really showing the process part of that unless you're doing an installation in which the process is the part of it but uh you don't see that on the design side as much so i mean maybe that's it i, I don't know i mean that was my assumption is sort of just that and i mean to be honest like review in the open source community is probably worse than any critique I ever had in a formal academic studio art setting, I have to say. But I mean, you have to be open. And I mean, there's ways you can be open and not subject yourself to, I don't know, abuse. I I don't really know. That might be too strong a word to use. But I mean, there's ways of being open. Yeah, I mean... So I don't know. I mean, that's like a whole other thing. So you're talking back to even not just the tools about a piece of paper, post-it notes, talking to people. And I think that there's a component of sort of like an open design practice that is sort of even outside of the tools that I think I I would love to see be more common. I I don't see it being practiced. I I see it being practiced mostly by the the designers using the open source tools Um, probably because they were members of, you know, the communities necessarily that built the tools and they kind of picked it up there. But um, I'd I'd love to see that more pervasive, you know? Yeah. Well, and especially when when you, when you're working on projects that are inherently collaborative, like that, the um, just the whole concept of version control for, for artists is, is it takes, it takes a while, but the, the second that they realize they don't have to have like, a file with the word final six times at the end of it, version three. <laughs> you know, the, the, the second they realize that, they're like, oh, I have a save state for my work and I can go back like I'm playing a game. This is great. But like getting them to that point is 
it's a completely change of workflow in, 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 in some respects. Yeah. Uh, so, but okay. So, so one of the, th- so we've actually run circles around each other for, for, for a stretch here. Um, I think dating ourselves a bit. Um, we, I think I first met you at, uh, when Red Hat did a, a Red Hat High event where we were teaching open source and creative tools to, to, was it rising eighth and ninth graders? Yep. Yeah. And, and so you were doing Inkscape and, and a comic book track, I think. And I was, I was on the blender side of things doing crazy animation stuff. Um, and so from that point forward, we, we sort of went back and forth. There was one point in time, because this part of this podcast, I'm going to say right now is, is, or at least this iteration of the podcast is entirely your fault. Um, you, might, you might not know it, <laughs> but it's okay. entirely your fault. Uh, and that's because we were, um, there, there was a, a conversation on Twitter at one point, and this is again, a number of years back where, uh, we sort of wanted to show that the, the population of people who use open source tools, free software tools to do creative work, isn't like six people in the world. There's, the, it's, it's not, it, there's, there's a, lo- a number of people and they're actually really good at their work. And so we actually had this, this list of names that we're supposed to be interviewed and, and talked to and written articles about. And um, that that list I can't find anymore. And, and I, I don't know where it is. But from what I remember of the list, uh, I've been slowly trying to work my way down it. And, uh, and and because it's it is worth worth sharing. It is worth showing that that, you know, like you were saying, the um, it, the, the 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 it's the tools. It's it's not sorry. It's not just the tools. It's 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 the work you do. The work and by the way, I did it with with free software. Um, so in in that regard, um, what does your from a, from a design perspective, what what does your workflow typically look like in in general? Say we're because um, you're you're you've been doing a lot of the stuff with with the the Fedora project, and that's just is that 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 icons wallpaper all the graphical elements? Any particular parts of that? Um, so the main stuff I do for for Fedora these days, and it's extremely collaborative. So I feel bad even saying I do it because it's the whole team. But um, is the wallpaper every release every six months? Um, we actually we have a process for that. Um, we, we we get some critique on that. Um, there's folks who don't believe we should be doing a different wallpaper every release, and I understand that. Like they would rather we sort of stick with the theme for a few releases and sort of iterate on it over time as we get feedback. Um, I, I've always viewed the the default wallpaper for the distribution as sort of a showcase of what the distribution can do. And again, a showcase of what the open source process applied to design can do. Because I remember early days when we originally formed the Fedora design team, I remember I got the argument quite frequently, you can't do that with design. You can't do that with artwork. You know, the, the open source process is for kernel hackers. It's it's not for designers. And I was just like, wow, really? Okay, well, let me, let me show you. Um, and I, I definitely would say that like the whole process hasn't always been perfect. Um, but it's it's been sort of completely out in the open and in the public, I want to say since like Fedora Core 6 or so. Mm-hmm. And um, the process that we follow is every release, we, we started, I can't remember how far back, but I think this release we're on H. So what, that's like seven or eight releases ago. Um, we started the alphabet thing, but it's not like the code name for the release. And what we wanted to do was sort of highlight just different inventors or scientists or something because that's sort of like i don't know people who use fedora are kind of nerdy and you know they we all appreciate you know amazing scientists and inventors and stuff like that so we figured we would just using the alphabet we would try to highlight um a scientist or inventor and kind of just key off something about their work or their life or their accomplishments and use that as just sort of something to sort of almost like a a chaos generator. Like we need to draw something. So what are we going to do? So like this, this release, um, I'll just walk you through. Well, actually I'll walk you through, I think it was Fedora 25 because I think that one was probably our most successful one. That one, the inspiration was Alexander Graham Bell. So, you know, he invented the telephone, um, a a number of things involving audio and sound recording and playback and stuff like that. So, you know, we just kept thinking about, well, how could we reflect that visually? Like, how could we have a picture of that? And, you know, generally with wallpapers, there's like a lot of different, like you don't want it to be too high contrast, things that are more natural and without too many fine details are probably better. You don't want to distract users, stuff like that. So we thought, well, what if we did sort of like a landscape? 
And we were thinking about, well, how does the landscape kind of relate to Alexander Graham Bell? And we thought, oh, I know. When you look at like audio, like the the graph, oh. it almost kind of looks like trees if you say the right thing. So what we did is um, one of our contributors, Kyle, he recorded the word fedora and then made the graph. And then since it's a landscape and, you know, the graph is sort of like symmetrical on the, the X axis, um, the bottom half of the picture is water. So it's the trees reflecting in the water and the actual shape of the trees and the reflection is the word fedora being spoken aloud by one of our contributors. So we sort of, th that was something that it was just a lot of, we, we followed, um, you know, that old IDEO design thinking process. I mean, th that's sort of like the way I approach, it's like the hammer I hit every nail with. So we, we try to approach the um, wallpaper sort of in the same way. So we'll start with the problem which here is, okay, we need artwork around Alexander Graham Bell. And then we just sort of generate as many ideas as possible, cluster them, figure out, oh, you know, wait, we're going somewhere with the sound wave thing, and then kind of break out and work on solutions and then pick the best one and go forward with that. So, I mean, that's the process that we follow. We do it every six months. The one we're doing right now is um, this, this guy, um, I think his name is Walter Hawkins. His last name is Hawkins. And he invented some kind of polymer that helped connect rural communities to the telephone um, grid. So, you know, because before you couldn't make the wires that long without them getting corroded, so whatever. So um, the theme that we're following there is sort of connections. So what we've been working on is sort of like a, like a from space shot of a planet. And the fedora wallpapers change over time. So like you'll have a different one at sunrise versus noon versus evening versus okay. night. So um, over time, the desktop will light up more okay. and then back to dawn and then it'll reset and it'll light up more. So that's what we're working on there. So, you know, I think it's kind of a cool process, um, but I know it's a very specific one. But but that whole design thinking sort of, you know, generate lots of ideas, refine and then develop. That's sort of the, the process I follow for everything. But yeah, I mean, that, I mean that translate to your own personal work as well. Um because I, I found that what, like when I sometimes the stuff that I do where where somebody's paying me to do it, either I will be more fastidious with the process there, or in some cases because of timelines I will have no process and I just have to bang it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, if it's something I'm doing on my own, I mean, the thing about it is, and you know, I have three kids. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of stuff going on as we all do right now. Um, so I don't actually have a whole lot of time to just say, oh, hey, I have a chunk of hours to work on my thing. So I almost feel like I do follow the process in the back of my head over an extended period of time. So like I'll think about, oh, I want to make something for that. You know, like I'm looking at my wall in my office right now. I would actually love a picture there. So I'm just making up a scenario. So <laughs> I would love something for my wall right there. Hmm. What could go there? What colors would work? You know, whatever. And I'll have like this idea. And then as time goes on, I'll like come back to it and think about it every now and then. So I like do the process, but maybe over the course of a year or two rather than, you know, I have an actual deadline. But yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that's how human brains work, you know, is you're just, you, you might even do it without thinking about it. That makes sense. Um, so, so in dealing with specific applications and, and working with the, the 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 software itself and the communities of it, so I I, I hesitate in asking this one because it's a, sometimes it's a time bomb. Um, what's what's the most frustrating part of any particular program that that you've run into recently? <laughs> My biggest frustration, honestly, is just input output, like. For example, on Fedora right now, I've been using a lot of flat packs. Because, well, actually, the, the distro version of Inkscape is right now more stable than the flat pack, or at least the last time I tried to use the flat pack. But generally, I'm using these tools in flat pack form because it, the flat pack bundling is a lot newer than the distro, right. you know, whatever. But um, the problem with that, and it's not necessarily a problem, I mean, it's solvable, is that flat pack is sort of cut off from the rest of the operating system. It's like kind of a secure container type thing. So stuff like most recently used files in the file chooser don't always like across tools. Yeah. So I'm like always doing that scavenger hunt, like digging for the right folder to find an asset or digging for the right folder to save it out. Right. Um, so that's a bit of like, that's the biggest sink on my time right now. I guess you run into the same issue with um, like if you have, if you need specific extensions or, or, or add-ons for, for, because those are, 
those aren't necessarily going to be packed in that sandbox, right? Yeah, but that's no issue because you do, there's a trick and it, I actually had to ask Alexander Larson to find the actual path, but um, it's in, it's in your home directory under dot bar that unlocks all that magical stuff. And what I do actually is I do, um, I have a Git repo that has all those sorts of assets over time, like fonts and extensions and things right. like that. And I just sim link the directory under wherever. So user share, blah, and dot var, blah, is all sim linked to this folder that I have. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I haven't had the, um, I'll say the, the privilege, the honor, the the experience of working with with um, Flatpak or any of the the, the, the packaging systems because I've been I've been living in Arch for so long that whatever whatever the latest thing is, it's basically already there. Um, yeah. <laughs> does run into issues when you actually need the older version, um, but fortunately, most of the things we work with tend to be pretty reverse and backward and forward compatible with, with those sort of things. So hopefully I haven't run into too many issues with that. Yet. The main one is Scribus because oh. files aren't backwards compatible. And then for a while I could not actually use the newer version because I have a super high GPI screen oh, and right. I don't know. So I had to stay on the old version for a long time. Scribus, Scribus is one of those programs for me. It's, 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 it's so close. It's so close. The, the biggest problem I have yeah. is when I need to do like a large multi-page document, especially something with, with a lot of different graphics in it, because there's not like an encompassing book format that, that you can sort of say, essentially what well, chapter one is this one Scribus file, chapter two is this other Scribus file, and then sort of cap them all together and reference it and work, work with it from within Scribus. I would kill for something like that there. But um, like I, I had to do page formatting on on a so 300 page book and this was just text and scribus was scribus was not pleased with me <laughs> for oh, trying no. to do that. <laughs> I, I mean we, we we struggled through it together but um yeah scribus scribus was not pleased with me <laughs> but it is it is so close you know what i mean it like is, it's it is i mean it's it's, yeah. one of those, it's it's where video i think it's still one of those gaps but it's not as big of a gap as it used to be i think page layout is one of those sort of things that folks skipped over and realized oh crap we forgot to deal with that part of the the workflow because i think that's one of the things where you know um, we've got tools for for video we've got tools some a few tools for for visual effects and compositing but the page layout thing is still like if you're if you're working in print i mean i'm Sorry, you're working in print. But if you're if you're working in print, I mean your 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 options on the on the free software side are, are fairly limited. I mean you could do stuff, but it, it does take a le a level of um, sort of making things do what they weren't necessarily intended to do to make that happen. Right, and it's really a shame too, because it seems like of all the things that should be accomplishable, like print layout should be one of them. I mean, right, right, you know, like. We have so many like very like the, the command line tools like ghost script and stuff like that is very rich and and old and stable and it just never really manifested i guess i don't know i guess it, it kind of needs a, a a user experience wrapped around it <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> so sorry i didn't say anything because I this is also released in in, uh, in audio only. I'm I'm gesturing to Mo here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it actually re relative to that because I mean design design is is design, but there is there is a different when it comes to like working with user experience, working with the user interface. It's there's it's not just pretty pictures, right? There's 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 more involved with that. And are you using similar sort of workflows and, and methodologies for that what's you, you mentioned talking sure to people, which i'm sure is, is a thing <laughs> yeah ux is very political <laughs> not political like you know political political but like dealing with a lot of groups of different people and trying to sort of work out the balance of everyone's needs and have something that ends up being successful and is usable i mean it's 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 a struggle and when i went into ux i didn't realize that's what it was about Mostly, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I would say in terms of working with assets, um, the process is very similar. Um, when I when I start out on a UX project, um, depending on sort of how far along it is, you know, rarely do you get the privilege of working on something that's completely greenfield, right? Like you usually are coming in on something that has a history and some baggage and maybe some issues. Um, 
But, you know, I just would start out learning everything I can about what does this do? What is it capable of? What do people like it for? What do people dislike it for? What type of people are using it? What type of people should be using it? Like, and that's one of the big political issues that happens sometimes is like, you know, I don't know if you've seen the XKCD where like he wants a function on the keyboard because it keeps him warm because it makes the CP it's something like, like there's people like that using every tool and you know, they're your long time loyal users and you really don't want to hurt them and you don't want to cause issues. But at the same time, like it limits what the software can do if you can't make change. So it, it's sort of change management is like a little thing that you have to do there. Um, because you want to respect these people who've been loyal to you, but you also, you want to bring in, you, you, I mean, the, the overarching goal that I think a lot of us in, in free software have is we basically want to spread free software as widely as possible because it's, it's, I mean, it's a benefit. I almost see it as almost like a human right that I'm able to use software that also has source available that I have some control I can exert over it. So it can't just disappear one night and then 10 years of assets of my portfolio can't be accessed because this thing went away. I, I learned that early on because when, when I was in high school, I did a summer camp on Macromedia Director. Oh. And then my freshman year of school, I went all in on Director, all of my projects. By the time I was a senior graduating, I couldn't open any of my files. That, oh. for my, yeah, so I mean, I got burnt early on. So like, I'm, I was totally on board with the whole, and I, I'm actually surprised because this is a common thing for creatives to get burnt by, you know? And I see all these things, like there was recently, was it Basomic? Um, mockups um, announced that they were shutting down their my Basomic service and telling people get your files out and it's like well what am I going to do with my files it's not like there's an open source client or any client at all I can open them in if you're shutting down your web app so I mean you would think creatives would I, and I think they do like when you sit down and you explain that free software ethos they they get it I think because we've all been burned by that but anyway so back to the whole workflow um, I, I try to sort of do as much research as possible um, sometimes embed myself in communities. So like when I, when I started out, I worked on a, on a project that was focused on sysadmins. So I joined all sorts of sysadmin mailing lists. I went to a Lisa conference. Um, I interviewed people who are sysadmins, who are customers and sort of build up sort of a network of people I could talk to. So it, it's just a lot of talking for sure, but that's because you have to understand what people do, what their goals are and what resources they have at hand. You know, you can't design everything in a vacuum of, oh, if the world was perfect, this is how it would be, because the world is never going to be perfect. Right. <laughs> and things happen that are unexpected, and you don't even understand always, like, on the ground, the person using the software on the other end. I mean, they want to go home to their kids, and they're hungry, and they got stuff <laughs> to do. They don't want to spend the world of their time inside your software. They want to get in, get it done, and get out of there. And I think a lot of people miss that when they're like, building software. So they think people have so much time to read their email newsletters and to, you know, whatever. No, no, people just care about what they care about. And it's not you. And <laughs> once you figure that out, you know, like, you've kind of unlocked the key to user experience. Right. Um, but yeah, so there's like that front end UX stuff. But then once I understand what the users are trying to do, and sort of just their whole do problem domain, right? Um, you kind of got to look at the bits of the software that already exist. What are the limitations? Like, I remember, um, I'll harken back again to that system in app. It had a thing where one of the biggest user experience issues we had is um, people had licenses for their servers. And it was sort of a crapshoot. You wouldn't know which server would lose its connection when a subscription expired because it was just sort of like a bucket. It wasn't a one-to-one -one mapping. So you could have a production server lose its subscription or you could have a little QA test server nobody cared about. And the problem that was driving that was it was the way the backend was written. So it's not something that you could just quickly, you know, code up a solution for because, you know, the, the whole architecture of the system was built on this assumption. So you kind of want to learn those little gotchas. Like these are things that, you know, it'd be great if we could solve, but we can't. So don't design around changing that because we don't have two years and 20 developers to fix it or whatever it would involve. You have to be able to acknowledge those shortcomings and kind of account for them in, in your design work. And then, you know, 
you have to understand also sort of the people on the team, what they're capable of, what their skill sets are, what their backgrounds are, because you can use that to your advantage. You know, if you're trying to decide between three different potential solutions and, you know, one of the people on your team is really good and has a background in something that could make one of them really shine, then maybe you'd want to pick that one. So, you know, like I said, it's politics too. So, but then once you get all that stuff out of the way, yes. So what I will do is I will sit down probably with a pen- pencil and a piece of paper sketch out some ideas. I actually like to do them during calls when we're talking about stuff. Like we have weekly meetings. Um, usually for any product I work on, there's a weekly status meeting that I'll join. And, you know, sometimes a thing will come up, hey, we need a solution for this. So we'll kind of do a little deep dive. I'll sketch out ideas. I'll hold them up to the camera or I'll upload them and post the link and get people's feedback like in le- real time. And once we kind of understand, and these are like ugly, nasty sketches. Like they're just those boxes of words. Those are the best. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> And then once we're like happy with, yeah, I think that approach could work. All right, let's see how it works, you know, in the whole context of the interface and sort of the workflow of the interface. So then I'll sit down with Inkscape. Um, If I've never worked on it before, then I'll build sort of like a template for the basic user interface if there already is one. If there isn't, then I'll just make a quick wireframey thing. Um, Build out layers. I usually do one layer per screen. And Inkscape gets kind of angry if you do that a little bit too much. I've tried doing tricks like um, I'll make a template and then clone it and copy it. But at, at a certain point, if you have too many clones in a file, it also gets very angry and it gets angry in a scarier way than if you just duplicate it. So um, I'll have like a base thing on a lower level and that's just locked and always present. And then for each screen, I'll just have the stuff that is sort of the diff of that base. And I do it that way. And then I'll just break out a different SVG file for like section of the UI. So I, I've tried it all different ways. And this way is consistently the, the easiest one to do. So I do that. Um, I do use sort of a recent addition as in like the past two years or so to my workflow is the, the Inkscape symbols library feature, oh, which is yeah. awesome. Um, it's It kind of reminds me of the old Flash editor where you could just have like the library and drag stuff. And it's the same way you drag things out of the symbol library. And I think they're clones of the original one. So you can like get fancy and do stuff and like change all of them to a certain color or this or that. I, I don't normally do that. But um, I use it because the project I'm working on, I think we're using Font Awesome. So I actually have the font awesome symbol library loaded in. So the icons and it look exactly the same. So it nice. saves me so much time. It's my favorite feature. And Inkscape 1.0, which just recently came out, added a search box. <laughs> I was so excited. I tracked down the developer who like put that there. And I, I signed up for his Patreon because it just, that's a game changer that you could just right. search the icons, find what you need, slap it in, good to go. So that was great. Um, Yeah. And then I just, you know, just kind of work on it. I I might try things a few different ways. Um, And I set this all up in Git. So like the project that I'm working on right now has a GitHub org. So we have a a repo that's specifically just for for mockups and wireframes. Um, We have a lot of different components to the project. There's like the core UI. There's um, sort of like an app store UI. And there's, there's other different pieces to it, the website, whatever. So I just have a top level directory for each project in this design repo. And um, it just makes it really easy for me to, you know, share because I can just go, they they use GitHub. So I can just go to GitHub, wherever the PNG export was, I'll just send them the link to that. So, you know, I save it on my desktop and then there it is on GitHub. I mean, a nice integration would be I save it at GitHub and then in Inkscape, I can kind of get that URL of the PNG, but I know that's not happening. but yeah, I mean, it's not it's not a bad workflow. And I just, they use Slack. I'm not happy about Slack. I prefer <laughs> IRC or Matrix, but it's okay. I, I work with people where they are. So, you know, I just can post a link in Slack and it preloads the image. We get a discussion going. Wherever I can, I try to keep the discussion in, um, in, in a format and in a place where we can access it over time. So like when there's a lot of discussion about a piece of UI design that's in Slack, I try to move it to an issue. So the way that I use issues in this design repo, and it depending, like sometimes they're not in the design repo, but they're in the repo for the piece of, you know, like the the code repo for the actual UI. Um, I'll kind of use the GitHub issue tickets as spec files for features okay. that we're developing. So, and that way I can kind of copy paste Slack discussion into the issue so that when it scrolls out to the, you know, pay us money for your own chatter right, right. <laughs> stage, we have a copy. So we're good. 
Um, but it, it's also good because I'll just post on the issue and we just have like the back and forth. So the mock-ups and the comments and the back and forth and the decisions are all in one place. So later on, because this always happens, when we're trying to figure out why the heck did we do it that way, you can kind of look up the old ticket number and figure out, oh, that's how we did it. So yeah, so I mean, I'm using, and this is one specific project that's in GitHub. So I'm using a Git repo, I'm using GitHub issues, um, I'm using Slack, but you know, it, it's the same process depending, like I can switch out different tools. I've done the same in Bugzilla. I've done the same with wikis. I used to use wikis to do design specs. So, you know, same same kind of thing. It just I, I go wherever the upstream community I'm working with is, I, I meet them there. Right on. That's cool. Uh, actually, one of the things related to it, um, what are your thoughts on there's there's like there's been a push, I would say in the last five years, probably sooner than that. This, I guess in the last five years is the only time I started paying attention to it. But there's been a push for for kind of a data centric UI approach where you're talking you start talking about eye tracking and heat maps and 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 that kind of thing. Where does that fit anywhere with what you do, or is, or do you have feelings on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I do have feelings on it. So um, my background when I was in grad school, I, my master's degree is in human computer interaction. I was actually in a PhD program for it, and I dropped out to work at Red Hat <laughs> um, because you know I I have a lot of thoughts about that that I won't go into. But um, one of the things that was like so fancy is oh we have this user research lab and we have eye tracking software and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, what you learn about eye tracking software, and again, like I, it, I'm i not an expert in this. I have a little bit of experience with it. And like, I just finding after finding after finding that I saw, it basically tells you what language is the person's native language. So if somebody is a left to right speaker, they scan and like an F, you know, right. and then if, you know, if you're a right to left language native speaker, then it's just like the mirror image. And that's what people look at. And okay, did I need to do that for my specific software to understand that? It's Maybe the, not. The reinforcement of what you yeah. learn in design school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I just, I mean, you might find stuff like if I have a specific banner that, you know, like one of my professors in school used to call red the bear detector color. So if you see the color red on the screen and, and you're not colorblind, of course, you know, you, you kind of get drawn to it. So maybe you have some sort of like graphic or something that's bright red. So maybe when somebody is looking at the screen with the eye tracker, they just gravitate to the red. But you kind of knew that was going to happen because it's a bright red graphic, right? So I just, I don't, I, I feel like it's just people playing around with really expensive equipment. And right. I don't know that it always, the, the time and the monetary investment and the effort, I, I don't know if that sort of stuff is, is worthwhile. But I mean, I'm lazy too. And I mean, I, you know, the, the time spent doing that and the money spent doing that, I, I could have done a lot more. So I, I feel like it's not the right bang for the buck there. Um, with some of the other research stuff, I mean, I, I was just, I was talking to somebody earlier today. She's just graduated and looking at a career in UX. And she was kind of asking me about like, well, how much time do you spend user testing and how much time do you do this and that? And it feels like I, I spend a lot less time doing things like that. But I think it's because I, I follow this philosophy of I embed myself in the community of users and I try to feel out like what it is that they do and what they care about and their goals and their skills and that kind of stuff. If you have enough of a baseline by doing that sort of, you know, Jane Goodall embedding myself in the community type thing, then you can kind of skip all the basic stuff, like the basic questions and the basic testing stuff, because you already know it. And you can right. just do very targeted, focused questions, which take a whole lot less time. You know what I mean? Like, it could just be rather than sitting people through a 20 minute long experience clicking through an interface, I can just show them, listen, this screen, you want to do this, this, or this, what would you click on? And it takes like three minutes. Right. So it, it doesn't have to be so arduous and formalized anymore because you sort of just have this whole base of assumptions that you've built on by having experience with the users. So and, I, mean, I don't really... It's to be kind of a, a manufactured experience too. It's not, I mean, if you're trying to be sort of formal and rigorous about setting that up and all of a sudden it's not the way the person works it's the way that the system is designing them to play with working um well it's also the thing where you know the quantum physics where when you observe the thing it changes right. i mean i have this thing and it's like a clockwork orange and it's like uh, gosh i don't know where am i looking what's going on you know 
I mean, that's definitely negatively going to impact your user experience if you have this thing on your head and then slipping down and you're nervous and yeah. yeah I've, but I mean, the one testing thing that I think is the best thing that any designer could do if you're working in the field of UX is just, just get a user, an actual user that uses the software on any kind of regular basis, sit them down and get a developer that works on the software and just have them, you know, it could be in the control room so they're not there, you don't hear them or whatever, but just have them sit and watch someone using the software. And that's just no questions, just, hey, you know, you, you normally do this thing, you, you, you patch the servers on Wednesdays at two o'clock, do it, and we're just gonna watch. Right. And just, you, it gets them on your side, like they understand, oh, that's what you do. Oh man, people actually use what I code. Oh my gosh, oh God. It, it just sort of, well, and I don't know. That's one of the funny things. If, if you're spending all of your time, like I see, I spend a lot of time talking to creatives, and I don't know if it's the same feeling. I don't necessarily think it's the same feeling from the de developer side, but I get the impression that there's the, and maybe maybe it's it's because there's this migration. Uh, I won't say migration, but there's holdovers from from a closed so closed source workflow where you have this kind of us versus them mentality where the developers are doing this thing and and the creatives are doing this thing and they don't want to talk to each other because they each have their own way of wanting to do it and normally at least in my experience it's always like you're actually using it okay so what do you want to do because i'll do exactly what you want because i know you're using it um and I, I don't know how to bridge that gap though it's it's a really it seems like that it seems like a no-brainer when you explain it like that but trying to break people of the thought that that development happens over there and using the software isn't part of the development process it seems seems like a hard one to crack yeah well i think i think the one thing there is i like to break out roles because i think a lot of times when you run into that sort of like designer developer headbutting stuff going on and it happens at the product manager too and then <laughs> you have a common enemy and then you unite no um no i i think how how you fix that is sort of divide the roles so like Engineers are engineers because they love technology. So they, like, like I said, let's like with the eye tracking, like, ooh, because they like to geek out with like the tech. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, maybe not the most worthwhile thing for the problem at hand. In, in the same way, like engineers are in that because they love tech. So you have to sort of say, listen, um, I as the user experience person talking to the users, I will come to you with a problem. I'm not going to try to implement it or even suggest the way that you should fix it. I will just tell you, li listen, this is what users want to do. This is the problem they're running into. I will let you, the engineer who understands all of the back end, how things are set up, what will take you more time and will be harder to maintain versus what you can do easily and is you know cheap and maintainable. I will let you decide the best way to solve that problem. And then that's where we meet in the middle. So where sort of like an engineer starts going into the, well, maybe we should solve this other problem. Engineers love edge cases. So it's like, well, what about this edge case or this edge case? And you kind of have to bring it back to listen. Okay, problem is my domain. So let's talk about that. And we'll talk to real users and see if this edge case actually ever comes up. And then with the engineers, you know, if, if me as a designer, I start putting my hand into things that maybe I shouldn't, they got to slap that hand back out of the cookie jar and be like, nope, we own the implementation. We own actually figuring out the best way to solve the problem. Stay in your problem side of the fence. And I think that that works pretty well. And where we're, it intersects a lot of times with product managers, the product manager is more, at least should be, and I know traditionally product managers have had to do everything and it sucks. It's like a very intense sort of all over the place job. They kind of should be looking at the market. Like what market should we be going for? And you know, what is the market need? What are the competitors? That kind of stuff. And they should be focused less on sort of the user experience stuff. User experience is important. Everybody wants it. Let the experts figure out that part. Right. So that's how I sort of try to just like divvy up the land and make sure everybody knows where their side of the fence is and just come back to that as like a grounding thing whenever a conflict comes up. Now, so, but how do you manage that with a, with say a tool where your entire audience are designers, right? You have something like Inkscape, you have something like, like Krita or Gimp yeah. or any of these, and everybody has an opinion and there, a lot of them are informed, but they're informed by a very particular workflow or, or those sort of things that, how do we, right. how, do you, how do you navigate that one? <laughs> well, I think you need sort of, well, I mean, it, it depends too. Like it depends on like, 
what is the structure of the interaction? Like, how is that structured? Like, is this primarily through bug reports, right? Because right. people in bug reports, they get a little testy because <laughs> what brought them there is never usually happy, right? right. Um, so, I mean, and if you want to moderate something like that, where you have a lot of really smart, you know, talented designers talking about their design tools, but maybe they're not in the best of moods because it failed for them. And that's why they're there in the first place. You want to temper that by going out to them on a non inspired by something bad, you know, <laughs> framework and be like, Hey, let's just talk about generally, you know, what things are you doing the most interface? What do you like? What do you dislike? What are the biggest problems that you have? That sort of stuff. And so if you can temper, the, the sort of acute issues with a more broad informed experience, I think you can use that to sort of figure out which of the angry bug reports are kind of the most relevant to what you're trying to do. Because I mean, in the end, I think it's the people building the software that need to determine its fate. I think that should be in collaboration with the users. But, you know, for example, like people really want this one feature, but if it's an open source project, it's your code you get to decide. And if you feel like that's not, don't feel pressured to do it. It, it, It's political too. I mean, it very much is political. Like if the right person comes along and asks for a feature, you might be like, well, maybe I will do it. But just think about, it's almost like a piece of software is your baby and you want to just do the best for it and get it on the right track to go to college or whatever. (laughs) You, You have to do that. And other people coming in and complaining and whatever, you just have to sort of, you know, be informed about where they're coming from and, kind of take it in that perspective that makes sense well i think we're coming to the close of of otherwise i i could keep talking to you for for hours about this stuff. <laughs> um, i'll probably pester you on social media and stuff about it just because that's fun to talk about but we'll let the the episode come to its its its, its concluding point here where where on the various corners of of yonder inter, interweber nets can can people find you Sure. So I have a blog that I wish I posted two more. Um, it's at blog.linuxgirl.com, but it's Linux with a gr. So it's L-I-N-U-X-G-R-R-L.com because I'm stubborn <laughs> and problematic sometimes. Um, on Twitter, I'm just Maureen spelled M-A-I-R-I-N. Um, I tweet in Irish sometimes and the Twitter translation thing doesn't work. So there's that. Um, but Twitter, I kind of use as like an angry shout bucket. So it's probably not worth watching. Um, I'm usually for like Fedora work. Um, I use Matrix, but it's just, it's mapped to an IRC channel. So pound Fedora design on free node. Um, yeah. Cool. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this and, and sharing all this fun stuff. This is, uh, now I have notes and stuff that I need to, read up on more so that's awesome and uh awesome. yeah thanks a lot for coming in and, and joining on the show thanks for having me and that's our talk huge thank you to mo for agreeing to actually be on the show she's a ton of fun to talk with and i really i really like her personal approach to user interactions uh, i mean that's really really what it's all about right it's it's interaction why why wouldn't you do that i mean it's 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 in the term user interaction. So if you, if you, if you want to design something that interacts with people, it kind of makes sense that, well, you, you, you would want to interact with those people. It's, um, seems like it's kind of important. Maybe, maybe that's something we should all think about with our, our own personal user interfaces with people and how, how that part of it works into it. Because, you know, some of us can be a little, um, bristly. (laughs) In any case, let me know what parts of the conversation that you found interesting. You can do that by tracking me down on social media. I'm Jason Van Gumster. You can look for me as Monster Java Guns. That's me pretty much everywhere. And specifically to the show, it's OSS Creative or Open Source Creative, of course. And wherever you find me, tell me what you think there. Uh, I also, of course, have an email newsletter. You can subscribe to it by going to the contact page. I'm pointing over here like it's, there's a website there. But um, and for those of you who are on audio, it doesn't mean anything to you. But in any case, go to the contact page at opensourcecreative.org and you'll be able to get on to the mailing list without a problem. All right, enough rambling. Let's get on. It's, uh, I messed up the end of this. In any case, now it's time to get to work.
job. It's get on with the, the fun stuff. Whee! <laughs> <laughs>